What's up, everybody? It's your boy, Offseason Prez, here in the Knicks offseason because we're now eliminated, ready to talk about draft stuff and not the NBA season, which is still going. And to help me talk about not the NBA season, I have a special first-time guest on Draft Strickland. It is Bryce Simon. You can find him on Twitter, at Motor City Hoops. He is also often on these internets with Sam Vicini talking about the draft on the Game Theory podcast. And you can also find him talking about the Pistons for the Pistons Pulse podcast. And he's here to help me make sense of A, what the Knicks might do, and B, what the Pistons might do. Two questions that I have no answers to. <laughs> so Bryce, thank you for joining us. How you doing today? What's up, Prez, man? I thank you for having me. Yeah, I, I'm. I wish this was happening a week or so later. We were talking a little bit before recording. This and this Knicks team this year was one of the funnest teams for me to watch. I was. They were so enjoyable. They're kind of like took this underdog mentality, even though it's New York and Jalen Brunson. Honestly, he proved me wrong a little bit. And, you know, through all the injuries, they just found other guys to step up. So I, I wish they would have made it to the Eastern Conference Finals and, and you'd still be doing that stuff. But, of course, I enjoy talking NBA draft. And we'll work through this Knicks stuff together because I, I don't think they can just draft anybody, Prez. Like, Tom, you know, Thibodeau has his guys that, you know, if you're not a certain type of player, I don't know that you're going to play for him. So we'll be able to hash all that out. Yeah, they they perhaps more than most teams in the NBA definitely have a type. Yeah, whether it's influenced by Tibbs or the other people in the front sure. office, like former Jazz GM or assistant GM Walt Perrin. Um, before we talk about the Knicks and Pistons draft stuff, uh, I did want to get your take on some uh, Pistonsy things that came across my Twitter. Okay. Uh, so is this? Tra I, I don't even know how to pronounce his name. Tra Trajan Langdon. Trajan Langdon, yep. Is that, is that official? Is he going to like run the Pistons or is that not yes. official yet? So I don't think it's official, but I mean, the reporting of it pretty much makes it official. You know, it was the mm -hmm. sources tell us that they're going to finalize a contract the next week. You know, th that kind of language where, you know, I don't think the team has announced it, but it sounds like it's essentially a done deal. So for those of you that, you know, are not Pistons fans and haven't followed this, which you shouldn't be because they aren't any good. And I don't know why anybody would follow them. So the Pistons have not fired any decision makers. They essentially created a new position, president mm. of basketball operations. And it's my understanding that the new president of basketball operations, which sounds like it will be Trajan Langdon will run the show. So Troy Weaver was the GM. Troy Weaver did not get fired. They essentially hired someone above him. And now Trajan Langdon my understanding is has the power to come in and fire Troy Weaver and hire a new GM, fire Monty Williams, the head coach, and find a new head. Like he has full control over how this thing builds out moving forward. Uh, of course, along with the draft and free agency and trades and all of those things. This is fascinating because it's not dissimilar from what happened with the Knicks, which happened in the kind of funniest way possible in retrospect. Like when Liam Rose came in, they created the president role and they didn't get rid of Scott Perry, who was the GM. They kind of just was like, all right, you sit at that end over the of the table over there and we'll say hello to you every now and then. So they didn't like can him immediately, but you could tell they were like, all right, you sit over there. Also, by the way, we're hiring Brock Adler and World Wide West and Walt Perrin. And then it's like, oh, you're an ornament. OK, I see what's going on here. So it'll be interesting to see yes. whether whether Langdon truly like cleans house or just keeps these guys around for continuity or or whatever. So uh, I, I even separate from the players on the team, there's probably some uh, big decisions coming up there. Yeah, I mean, I, I could see like with Weaver, like if you're Langdon and it, here's the other thing we don't know, like, do they have any sort of relationship throughout the years? Right. Like Langdon right. was you know, college basketball player, NBA player, been around, have their cr paths crossed over the last how many ever years? Do they have maybe a not great relationship? You know, so you, we don't know th that stuff. And so, you know, I could see where Weaver could be beneficial to him just in terms of this is the team Weaver built as bad and as wrong as it was. 
maybe Weaver's learned some lessons. Maybe he can, like, nobody should know this team better than Troy Weaver, again, as bad as it is. So you would think that Langdon could use that as some sort of resource. But if you're Troy Weaver and you just, you know, had somebody hired over you for all of these decisions, how do you feel? Like, can you swallow your pride and stay around? So that whole dynamic will be interesting and fascinating to see what, and here's the thing that, you know, Langdon, it's probably going to be first of June by this is official well, the draft and free agency is less than a month away. Does he have time to fire mm-hmm. people and hire new ones in that stretch? So um, it, it's a little bit of a time crunch with how they they work. I think I know they, they took their shot with some people, didn't hit. Tim Connolly was a name that kept coming up and kept coming up. You know, the Wolves kept winning and kept winning. And so I think they finally decided this is where they needed to go. That is interesting. And... It is a good segue for the other pistons thing, which actually is related to the draft, that it just kind of scuttled across my timeline. So I'm just going to read it here from Reddit. Okay. Uh, that, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that Matas Buzelis' agent is Michael Tellum, who is Arn Tellum's son, Arn the super agent, who is currently, uh, I think, vice president of the Pistons? Yeah, if, and, or, or, yeah just to be clear, like Arn's... <laughs> position within the organization isn't as much personnel as some people will lead you to believe online Mm. um um, it is more like the business side and and that type of stuff but yes arn tellum is definitely within the organization and anytime a tellum you know client comes to detroit there's always that conversation and i'll I'll let you finish that because that's where (laughs) you're going with with buzelis here yeah yeah it's uh well like it's interesting because yeah that's what i got just from doing my five seconds of googles is like okay he's he's helping running the pistons like as an organization not in the basketball sense but in the like this is a large business entity sense yeah and he has run large businesses before and then you have uh in addition to michael who's Mata's agent you have the other son Eric who uh actually does work on the basketball side of things in pro scouting and uh player personnel um so they they're around there and you know there's some people on the internet who are like well pencil Mata's in for the Pistons at five which for the record I would not be mad at and we can get into that in a bit but like I always just wonder about that like and you, we get versions of that on the Knicks, right? You have. I was going to say, Rose. isn't this yeah. the CAA <laughs> with New York? I mean, yeah, <laughs> right. Like, what? There's not a lot of difference, correct? Yeah, and but the funny thing is, is like, there have been a few instances of like, yep, CAA did the CAA thing, but like, really, it was way vastly overstated in the end. Because sure. what happens with guys like Leon Rose and Arn? These guys are legit as well known as any basketball business people is like, unless you have a blood feud with Rich Paul at clutch, you probably have a great relationship with guys at other agencies as well, just because you have to, right? Yeah. 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 You have to be able to work with all of these. And like you said, we're going to get into it. Um, My thoughts on Matos have been all over the place. I've talked to people (laughs) who are super low on Buzelis. But at the end of the day, whether he was a tell him client or not, he's going to be in this conversation. He could totally. be rep by a complete, he could be repping himself, Prez, <laughs> and he would be in this conversation. So, I mean, I, I understand it. It's interesting. Connect, but I feel like, you know, if you want to call this nepotism, like it's all over, like it's all over the place. Like, yep. <laughs> look at the, like, why is Giannis's brother on the team? You know, like also we're, what's going to happen with Bronny? Like it just, it's part of, and it's not just part of the NBA. It's part of all, I, I'm a teacher. Like we have people who are on our school board whose spouses work in the school. Like theoretically, that's the same. Like there's nepotism there, right? Like they're making decisions that influence. Like it's all over our world. So um, I understand the conversations. I get it. Uh, I tr- I just try to avoid all of that. When we talk about Matas, I will talk about it on the merits of my scout yeah, of and, and all of that. <laughs> but no, you're right. Like it's definitely something that. I continue, like people will tweet it at me, bring it, you know, DM me about it. So it's definitely on Pistons fans' minds. The It was funny. Like I, I never realized those connections and the, the Matas non-basketball thing I would always think about earlier this season was actually with the Bulls, just with Karnasovas uh, and Matas, you know, Matas being from Chicago and um, them having similar backgrounds and all that. And I was like, oh, the Bulls are going to be thirsty for this dude, right? But then they got like low key a little better and their pick got a little worse and 
all that stuff. So uh, who knows what's going to happen. But we can get into the the possibles for the Pistons pick. So um, I saw on uh, the internet a consensus board from uh, John Chepkovich, who's now okay. the scouting director of Draft Express. And he updates it every so often. And he just takes like ESPN and CBS and Yahoo and The Athletic and a bunch of people and just kind of averages out like what a consensus mock draft would look like. And right now uh, it's Saar at one, Risache at two, Klingon at three, Topic at four, Matas at five, Reed at six. Although if you believe uh, ESPN, uh, he's a lock for the top five now. Um, Dillingham at seven, Castle at eight, Connect at nine, and Holland at 10. So that's kind of like the guys getting the buzz around yep. where the Pistons are picking. And before we get into like who we think they will pick, if you were the emperor, if you were Arn, if you were vice president, emperor, whatever of Detroit, like who's the guy who's just circled in bold for you? Or is there not like one specific player? I mean, this draft is very interesting, especially at the top in terms of there aren't those guys, you know, Mm -hmm. like I I try to tell Pistons. So here, let's run it back just a little bit to the lottery, right? (laughs) Pistons are the worst team. They drop from one to five again. So for Knicks fans who don't know, the Pistons dropped from one to five last year. Listen, I, I don't feel bad. Like there's no sympathy. I'm not asking for sympathy. When you're the worst team, bad stuff happens to you. Get better. But I tried hey, to tell we, we've been there. We've been yeah. there. The Zion here. That's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. So what what I try to tell Pistons fans is this isn't the draft to be upset about dropping from one to five. That was last year, whenever you didn't right. stay at one to draft Victor, or even in the top three where you could have got a Brandon Miller. And I still think Scoot's gonna be fine, but that's a different conversation for a different day. Because this draft doesn't have that just elite prospect at the top. So I I, I do game theory with Sam Bassini. You mentioned the athletic a little bit ago. And Sam has said multiple times on the pod that he keeps his tiers the same from year to year. And a tier, you know, so the tier one, tier two, tier three. He said, I don't have any tier one or tier two prospects in this draft at all. So like Damn. that that kind of tells you about the, the high-end talent. Now, are there still going to be good players? Absolutely. Are there going to be role players? Absolutely. Is there going to be a star out of this draft? Somebody will find it. Absolutely. But right now, as prospects, there just aren't those guys. Like, I think Alex Starr is the number one prospect, Prez. I'm not upset, like crazy, over-the-top upset that the Pistons aren't going to have a chance to draft him. And I honestly think just about everybody else that you mentioned is going to be in play depending on what the teams in front do, right? Like, obviously, three other guys are going to be picked. But if you tell me Zachary Risa falls to five to Detroit, I think it's possible. I don't know that it's likely, but I think it's possible. And to answer your initial question, Risa is the guy that I still have kind of my my eyes on for Detroit. I think he makes the most sense. That That is uh, that is good to hear. I'm a big Risa Shea fan. I, uh, I was kind of low on him, and then I, I just – started slowly coming back around uh just watching him lately and you know he's got he's been playing such a long season and he had the slump which probably is connected to that very long season right like way more games than any college player um so you know just thinking more about like uh comp- the thought process i went through with recess was like all right him and keegan murray are a lot different right keegan was a big boy who did big boy things in college, pushed a lot of a lot of people around physically, who also happened to have an absolute ratchet, which benefited him more in the NBA, where that sure. was a much bigger part of his role than uh in college. And I'm like, why can't Zach do the kind of like perimeter shooting stuff that Keegan does? Obviously, Zach is not gonna like do the closeout attacks that involve like bumping somebody off because he's a lot lighter than Keegan. But as far as the both their players, both those players fastballs in the NBA, I feel like should be awfully similar. And when I put it that way, I was like, hmm, may- maybe I should have Rizache higher if he's this tall and he's going to be able to be splashy from all over the place. Yeah, I mean, I like that you bring up Keegan Murray because, you know, I'm not a big player comp guy. I'm a, like, Mm -hmm. what's the role or archetype comp? And so I think Keegan Murray 
is an interesting role slash archetype comp. They're not going to do it in the same way, but ultimately Keegan's role is what? To be a very good defender, hopefully. And then, like you say, splash threes, knock down shots, and then grow his ability to close out those attacks of, of because of his shooting gravity and those type of things. I, I think another one is Trey Murphy the third for the Pelicans. That's the one I get quite a bit for Zachary Reese and so I, I believe in Reese's Day's jumper, and I'm glad you brought up how many games he's played because this is something I've talked about as well. He's up to 62 games, Prez. That's a lot of games in a professional league, and he played the majority of those as an 18-year-old. So whenever you look at his numbers and that he went through a stretch where he didn't shoot it very well, I mean, come on. We're talking about a pro league for an 18-year-old and a 62-game sample. He's still at 38% from three. So I buy the shot. I think the mechanics are good. If you guys want to check it out, me and Sam broke down his footwork and, and really his entire game over on YouTube. It's its own little – we we broke it out separate from the, the entire episode so you can see that. But I think Risa Shea is going to be good, right? Does he look like a number two pick, Prez? Maybe not, right? But – like at the top of the draft, these guys just aren't going to look like that. There, you, There's nobody that you say, oh, that looks like a number one pick. You know what I mean? So I think Risa Shea is going to be a really solid role player, real solid three and D wing slash forward in a modern NBA that values and is always looking for those type of players. Yeah, I'm going to definitely check out that uh, mechanics breakdown. Long time draft Strickland listeners know that there's nothing – the Prez loves to talk about more than shooting mechanics. So uh, you've tempted me with a good time and I will take you up on it. <laughs> it was a lot of, it was a lot of footwork stuff. So we broke down his entire game, but we really get into like a 10 minute stretch where we just look at his footwork and all of his different attempts. So um, yeah, it's, it's over there on the game theory podcast on YouTube. Cool. I will check that out and I will link to it after so other people could see it because I know folks are going to be interested. Um, the one thing I worry about, well, here, here's my theory of Matas. So like, okay, and it, it, I mean, not Matas, sorry, uh, Recess Day. And it sort of applies to a lot of these guys because they're not those like incredible top picks that we are used to seeing in the last couple of years. I feel like the fit and the role matters even more, right? Like you yep. said, you know, you could have a team that uses Risache like Trey Murphy or like Keegan, and that's probably smart. But you could also have a team that fucks this up and uses him like, you know, like Brandon you know. Miller. Like if, if you were drafting right. Risache <laughs> and trying to make him Brandon Miller, you were going to be disappointed. Right. Exactly. And, you know, along the same line, the same is also true on defense. Right. And I've had this about this thought about Trey Murphy a lot, which is like, what positions can he defend? And that's not to say that he's not a versatile defender because he is, but like, where are his talents on defense best used, right? Even same with Keegan. The guy is pretty big, but like, do you want him defending the big fours? Do you want Harrison Barnes defending the big fours, right? What, what are we really doing here? So like, whoever picks him is going to have a lot of those questions. And watching Risa Shea on defense, part of me is like, I would just put him on like smaller players. Yeah, because he has that even though he's tall, he's not like he has very agile feet for a tall yeah. guy. He's almost just like to me, I kind of view him as just a shooting guard who kind of sprouted sure. a bit. <laughs> like, yeah. No, that's what <laughs> me and Sam went through this quite a bit as we talked about Risa Shea versus Buzelis. And mm -hmm. I very much look at Risa Shea as a wing right now. Mm -hmm. Um, and I look at, so like, I'm talking, when I say for me, if, if you want to get like, like, so he's like a small forward to me and like mm -hmm. very much a small forward that to you, like you say, maybe would trend more to playing as a shooting guard. If we want to use those positions as opposed to Buzelis, who I think is very much a forward. So right. like think a four man, a power forward, you know, Jeremy Grant type archetype. Like I look at Jeremy Grant as a, you know, more of a forward than a wing. And there's not a ton of distinction there, but it's about size, who you can guard, a little bit of your skill set. Some of the, you're still an off the ball type of player. But yeah, I'm with you on Risa Shea in terms of that, um, where I, I don't think he's going to be, you know, he's not going to guard Julius Randle, you know, <laughs> and, and, and hold up in a situation like that. So he'll be stuck on Josh Hart instead. Good oh, luck. Yeah. Good, lu yeah. good luck. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Good luck boxing that out. <laughs> You can just or OG, <laughs> you guys are loaded with like these big physical wing forwards anyway. Like none none of these rookies are gonna have a chance against the Knicks, uh, you know, 
wing forward room. Those guys, yeah, too physical. We'll talk about it later, but like we, the Knicks are weird on the wing front. Like we got all these like Jack dudes, but we don't really have that many wings. It's just like Julius yeah. and OG, and then it's like, oh, everybody else is like six foot four or yeah. three or two or one. But, <laughs> so. but Josh Hart plays like he's six nine, so it doesn't right. like it's okay. Yeah, he he definitely uh, lets us cheat a little bit on that front. Um, but Theo, I, I like the distinction between wing and and forward for Risache and Matas because one thing I've been thinking about with both of them and just in general is like I've whiffed on an awful lot of players who I was fucking obsessed with because I underestimated how how detrimental it would be for Twigs to be physically weak coming into the nba like whether yeah. it's like i was high on zaire coming out of high school i was high on bj boston coming out of high school like uh, once i started thinking about it this way and just going back through my old draft stuff i'm like damn this is a pattern here and then you know thinking about the knicks like we were just saying the knicks actually do the reverse they're like if you aren't like a crossfit champion we're not gonna pick you and even emmanuel quickly who is skinny like quickly got low-key kind of shredded so in his own right, so like I'm thinking about it and I'm like, I know some of these skinny guys succeed, obviously, right? Like the poster childs were Wemby and Chet, but they're like kind of in their own insane category of alien, gigantic, slender man people. So uh with these guys, like how how are you kind of looking at their skinniness as a risk factor? Is it like slow down yellow light kind of thing we'll just get them a bunch of burgers and calories and midwest food and be good like where, where are you at on that no it's a great point i think with both of them very early on in weaknesses or areas of improvement strength functional strength especially like that's one thing with chet like chet is skinny like let's let's be real here but he just has this crazy like practical functional strength where he's able to hold up and I don't know that I'm the best at evaluating that, but like, listen, like we broke down some stuff on Risa on that breakdown where, Hey, he wasn't able to finish off this drive because he couldn't stay on his line, you know, and, and mm -hmm. things like that. I think Buzelis, I, I think is the same thing. And for Buzelis is because I see him more as a forward who like some right. people have even pitched to me, Buzelis playing as a small ball, big, you know, cause he is like you know, his standing reach, I think was, just a like an inch and a half below Kyle Filipowski, but Buzelis was much more athletic. Now it'd be a completely shift change for him in terms of like, can you play drop coverage? Do you know mm -hmm. how to defend bigs? Those type of things. But Buzelis isn't even 200 pounds from the combine numbers. So I think, I think it's real easy to say, well, they'll get in the NBA and they'll bulk up and they'll get stronger, but some guys' bodies are just different like that, or maybe they don't commit to it. You know, there's, there's a lot. One thing I've learned, Prez, and I haven't do, been doing this for very long. This was my first real full cycle of doing this. There's a lot of intel we don't know, right? Like we we don't know who these guys are as kids, their work ethic, you know, those type of things. And, and that stuff is really important. But that's a really good point with definitely these two guys. Cody Williams is another one, Perez, yep, where yep. everybody just assumes he's going to get jacked because his brother is jacked. But I'm sure we all could, you know, point. Hey, to man, my brother's jacked didn't didn't work for me. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, it's, you know, uh, another one, Rob Dillingham. Like, yeah. this is a kid who insanely talented offensively, Prez. Insanely. I think I'm higher on his passing than even other people are. And I think everybody believes in the shot making and the scoring. He weighed like 160 pounds. Like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's one of the lightest players mm -hmm. that we've seen the last four or five years and probably going back further than that. How does that hold up? You know, we talk about injuries and everything we're seeing right now. That gets acerbated whenever you're talking about these guys that are so skinny and small. So I think it's a great, great point you've made with, with that, with Risa Shea, Buzelis. And, um, and then when we talk about some of these other guys who don't have those concerns as much. Yeah, I think the last guard, if you want to know how long I've been a draft sicko, the last guard I remember with those kind of with that kind of weight measurements who was getting draft buzz was VCU legend Eric Mailer <laughs> way back in the day. I remember so, it. Yep. <laughs> who uh knocked off uh knocked off my huskies. Um, but yeah, okay, cool. That's interesting. That's one of those things where like the Knicks aren't picking top 10, so I'm not really stressed about that, thankfully. But um it just seems like like you said, this class just got a lot of skinny dudes and uh you know, 
we know intellectually what you said, which is like everybody's going to, you know, get into a strength and conditioning program, but different people's frames can put on weight differently. And like I said, with quickly, like he came in like actually skinny, but like you could tell he had a good frame to put some meat on the bones. Like I, I, I do this in a very amateurish way and I'm definitely not good at it as well. Hence all the misses. But I'm like, everybody misses like, Prez. Everybody misses. Not everybody will admit to him. So I appreciate that with you. Oh, I love I love talking about my missus just because, like I said, once you've been doing this for like Sam knows too. like once you do this, you're going to have misses and a you can learn from them. And then B, some of them are just straight up hilarious. And unlike Sam, my livelihood doesn't depend on this. I'm just doing this for shit. So I have a, a little bit less skin in the game than than some other people. Sure. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking at research. It feels to me like he can he has a little bit better of a frame than Matas and the fact that he's not a forward like you said gives him a little bit more room for error because he's going to be more likely on a Josh Hart as opposed to a Julius Randle right or on a Deuce McBride or something like that and yeah those guys might give him a good bump but He's six ten, so he might be able to get some of that space that they make back just from sticking his arms out. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how that kind of goes um, for him. For Matas, um, it's interesting. He he's he's probably even more like depends on the role archetype than Risache, right? Like you could do a lot of things with him, like depending on how good you think of a shooter he is, like depending on how willing you are because he he may be skinny and he may get pushed around but he weirdly is physical right like he likes mixing it up despite that so like he has the right mindset to just like get in the mix and go run into somebody to try to get a weak side block and and all that it's just like all right we just need to get you a little bit of hgh and then maximize all of this so um with someone like him like what can you say a little more? I know you mentioned like that you classify him as a forward. If the Pistons took him, like how would you want them to use him? Yeah, I think what continues to have me intrigued with Buzelis is that I think he's an archetype I value, and I don't think you find a lot of in the NBA. So to me, he's like a four man that can cut off the ball, offensive re- like make cuts off the ball, offensive rebound. We'll we'll touch on the shooting. I'm sure we'll talk about that because at the end of the day, he's got to be able to shoot it, and then. With him, if he's your four man, not a wing, not your off ball guard, whatever, however you want to classify these things, you know, his passing and off the dribble game is a very positive in that scenario. You mm-hmm. know, where as opposed to him playing more on the wing or whatever, then maybe it's a little more neutral. You know, if he's trying to, at- again, if he's trying to attack Julius Randle, who's closing out to him in the corner, I think he would be able to do that. I'm not, listen, I love Julius Randle. I'm just using him as an example because <laughs> I'm on a Knicks podcast. I actually really do love Julius Randle. Fascinated to see what happens this offseason with him. And if he stays or, you know, I know there's some, some talk around there, but um, so that's what I see. And then on the defensive end for Buzelis, it's what you just mentioned, like low man rim protector, off ball disruptor, those type of things. He averaged almost three stocks a game. So almost two, two blocks and then almost one steal for the entirety of the ignite season. And I do want to just, I always like to make mention of this. If you guys are looking up ignite stats, use real GM, but scroll because on real GM, even they have it split up into the showcase stats and then it'll say regular season, but those, those are separate. You have to go to the full season stats or combined, or I I don't remember what the label is, but you want to go find that. So just make sure you, you look into that. Yeah. It says full season stats and you get everything for the whole year. I don't know why the G I guess it doesn't matter anymore because the ignite program is done. And again, that's another important caveat. Prez, Prez is, like this was not a good context for these guys. This league, At this all. program, not this league, this program was so bad, the NBA literally scrapped it. They didn't say we're going to overhaul it. They said we're getting rid of it. So when you're talking Ron Holland, Matas Buzelis, Tyler Smith, a guy I think we'll talk about for the Knicks, you got to keep that in mind whenever you're talking about those guys. There was no point guard in that program that was ready to run the show and get these guys the looks, which is what they're all best at is playing off the ball, knocking down shots, attacking and closeouts transition. If you're looking at Holland. Yeah. He, uh, one of the things coming into the ignite season, I was excited to see 
and ex- and worried that might go away is um Matas was kind of like an ambitious passer, probably too much in high school. Like the guy thought he was like fucking Luca out here or John yeah. Stockton or some shit. And he would just yeah. let these things fly. And the Ignite, you know, for better and for worse, like, you know, through their history, they they say this is your role. You're not gonna deviate from it. Sometimes it can be good, sometimes it can be bad um for a player's development. And for Matas, it, like he wasn't out here passing. It was just pretty straightforward, like forward role player stuff, like hit your threes, cut off, like other people having the ball, weak side blocks and stuff like that. But that's not the be all end all of his skill set. So it's just one of those things I wonder. And, you know, I mentioned a lot of my misses coming off of uh, skinny guys who I like their skill set. Another set of misses <coughs> that um, I had was from misprojecting a player's archetype and i'll give you the specific example that made me learn from this and also was kind of (laughs) hilarious like a lot of these i was super low on john kuminga even though he was a you know he had his gifts as an ignite wing and he was super athletic and all that because i was like somebody's gonna use this motherfucker thinking he's brandon miller or (laughs) t-mac or some shit and it's gonna go terribly wrong nobody's gonna use him as a small ball big and then the warriors used him as a small ball big and i was like (laughs) oh oh so I look like an idiot. Thanks, guys. So um, with Matas, that's what the kind of stuff I'm wondering. And like, I feel like with the Pistons, if they if they can get creative and, you know, they have other defenders, right? Asar, of course. And yeah, Duran finally learning how to play defense as he uh, turns 15 years old, uh, finally or whatever. So like they got they got some guys. And if if they bring Matas there, like that's that's three dogs who should be able to play defense and. Maybe Duran can give some of his muscles to Matas and they can even it out or something. But like, I, I really like that idea. Um, and personally, I don't know where you and, and Sam are on his shooting. Um, his shot is definitely not like a textbook, but I think his shot is going to be fine, actually. Yeah, so. man. it's a, <laughs> The shot is what it comes down to for me. And I, for the record, I think he'd be a great... The idea of who Montas Buzelis is, I think, fits really nice with the Pistons. It's it's a position and archetype that I think that they need and have been looking for. So I, I want to get that out of the way. I'm I don't know what to think about the shot. He <laughs> shot so for your listeners, he shot it really well in high school at Sunrise Christian, which is one of the biggest programs in the country. So we're talking mm-hmm. high level competition, you know, stuff like that. Over forty percent, um, not Grady Dick level of three point shooting, but he shot it well. And then with the Ignite, it just wasn't. Like, it straight up wasn't good. He shot 26%. He was only 70% from the free throw line. I just, I don't know. I've I've had people tell me that have really looked into it that have said, like, hey, the misses aren't that bad. It'll be okay. I've had people tell me that have looked into it that said, hey, there's some real issues here. I don't know. But again, this is why I like looking at him as a forward slash even maybe eventually a big is he doesn't need to be a 38% three-point shooter. Like, Risa Shea needs to shoot 38% from three, I think, to really be even the type of role player that we're talking about. I think if Matos is, like, 35% from three, and then with the plus-level passing and off-the-dribble and defense at that position, that archetype, that role, I think 35% on good volume would be enough for him to be successful and to feel good about. So I don't think he needs to be up there around 40 for what he does in his role, but I do have some worries about, you know, what if he ends up just being a 30% three-point shooter? I don't think that's going to cut it for it. Yeah, he, he has to be better than 30%, but he doesn't have to be resash levels. I agree. And I mean, you kind of hit it. Like, I, I consider him like a defense prospect who can do other stuff. Like, sure. Like, a, a lot of people naturally grab, look at these top picks and are like, all right, how many points are these guys going to score quickly? Right. Which that's what you should do with top picks. It's a big part of what makes top picks cool and effective. I get it. But like, in this year, you got to, like you said, you got to be a little more discerning. There's no Zions, no Lucas, no Mobleys, no nothing like that. So, like, um, it, like it, yeah, it was, <laughs> like at the end of the day, Kate Cunningham would be far and away the number one pick in this draft. There's literally like, like 10 guys from last year who I'd be, I'm like, probably they'd be number one. <laughs> I mean, so what I, what I've said for a while now, and I feel like it, it has turned out to be true, is if you just took an average draft's top three 
and put them in. I'm not talking last year with Victor and Scoot and, and Brandon Mill. Like, and, and think about what those guys were as prospects. I'm just saying like an average draft. Just take the average of the last 20 years and what the top three prospects look like as prospects. And if you put them in this draft, it would look awesome. If you're talking about Alex Saar as a number four pick, whoever's number four would be ecstatic. San Antonio would be pumped about pairing Alex Saar with Victor Wimbanyama at number four. And then, like, if you go off my board, you're looking at, like, someone like Steph Castle is there at eight. You know, Reed Shepard is now, like, mid to end of the lottery instead of, like you said earlier, top three, top five. I, I, we're just missing those two, three guys at the top that then push everybody else down a spot or two and where they, quote, unquote, look a little bit more like a number four pick, a number five, number six, whatever. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I, I couldn't put it any better. Um, so. If if we're talking about the Pistons, we've talked about Matas, we've talked about uh, Risache. Um, is there anybody else who who catches your eye who who would be in that mix? I mean, if those guys aren't on the board, that means somebody else probably is on the board who you thought would slip. So, like, who 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 else are you, you thinking of? Yeah. So let me eliminate. So like I said, I think SARS going one or two. Yeah. I don't. I don't think Topic makes sense even if he's there at five. Yeah. Ron Holland and Steph Castle are interesting because um, what they do defensively interests me a little bit. And I think Holland has some upside, but there's real shooting concerns there. We can, the Castle point guard thing that he's been throwing out. But I think the guys that really interest me, Dalton Connect is very interesting at five. Now that the Pistons have fallen to five, Reed Shepard is interesting. And I'll be honest, you brought up Jalen Dern in the defense. Donovan Klingon is a guy that's interesting to me. So um, I would say those three more than maybe anybody that, that we haven't talked about. I feel like, especially with these playoffs where you're seeing like Kat and Rudy and Jokic and, you know, lively and Gafford, even lively like, and Gafford, how the good Knicks, does that obviously work? before yeah. they got hit with the plague, had all these bigs and all that stuff. So, you know, at first I was like, man, the Pistons, the Rockets, like they, why would they think about Klingon, right? They got fives who they are investing in, but I can't blame, I can't blame teams for being curious. You know, I can't blame them. So my, my worry with Klingon is that's <clears throat> two non floor spacers. If, yeah. if you, if you thought yeah. one of those guys was going to shoot, then I would be like super in on it, you know, and you figure it out. Maybe you play them together against, you know, certain matchups for five or six minutes here and there, but those guys cannot share the floor together at all, obviously. And while I think Klingon's probably going to need to just play 20 to 25 minutes a game early in his career, eventually you're going to want to bump that. So right. I could see it. Um, you know, who knows what Trajan Langdon thinks about Jalen Duran and his defense and if it's ever going to get there or not. And, you know, we don't know what he thinks about Donovan Klingon, but, you know, Dalton Connect is the one that makes the most sense offensively. You know, this is a, a wing, you know, maybe a little bit of a guard at 6'6", really good athlete that just flat out scores the basketball. And I think his, on the low end, spaces the floor and knocks down a ton of three-pointers. On the high end, he's like a true three-level bucket getter that's, doing what we saw this last year at Tennessee, not very good defensively, but maybe he can get to neutral just with, you talk about size, physicality, um, athleticism. Maybe he gets to neutral just with those type of things. Yeah. Connect is, is a guy who I've been saying, I wouldn't be surprised if he went earlier than people mocked just because, He's a simple prospect, and if I'm a GM who cares about my fucking job security, I'm pretty sure Collect is not going to mess that up and get me canned. Like, you can have all the, why did you pick X superstar who went 15th or whatever, unknowingly or whatever, but, like, as long as your guy's all right, like, and Connect, he's going to be all right. Like you said, I, I fully believe in him as a multi-level wing scorer, just... He, he's, he the guy has crazy balance he can shoot it his release is like 12 feet high for no reason like he, he's just solid um and i always like to give this caveat anytime i talk about connect i realize he's 23 years old and i know what that normally means for a prospect this isn't your normal 23 year old in terms of progression he was a late bloomer in high school he played zone only in high school he went juco out of high school which listen i was a juco player myself so i don't mean to hate but not always getting the most progression and development and, and resources, right? Just in general, in terms of those things. Then he went to Northern Colorado, where again, 
love that program, love their coaching staff, all of that, but it's not Tennessee. It's not a power five program. They don't have power five nutrition and weight training and all of that stuff. And then he wasn't even at Tennessee for 12 months. He went to Tennessee. He chose Tennessee for two reasons. One, Kevin Durant was his favorite player. Rick Barnes had coached Durant. Two, defense. He wanted to go to a program that was going to force him to play defense where he could learn to play defense better. And I think he improved a little bit. But at the end of the day, he was... I mean, you've seen it, Prez. They ask him to do everything offensively. Like, how much energy did he have left to do some of the things defensively that he may have wanted to or they may have wanted him to? So my point of all of that is I think he has more room for growth than what your normal 23-year-old might have because of kind of his path. He hasn't been five years at a major Division One program with that type of coaching, development, nutrition, weight training, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think he has a little, I think he has another step in his game potentially. Yeah. One of the things I've taken away from these playoffs is, uh, and it seems like obvious when, when you say it out loud, but all of these teams that have made deep playoff runs in addition to the stars and all that have role players who can basically scale up for short periods of time and just go off for like 20 and a half. Like even guys who you wouldn't even consider offensive players, right? Like Jaden McDaniels, but like all these teams, have guys who could just, you know, Josh Hart, Jaden McDaniels, uh, PJ Washington is like the poster child for this, right? Yeah. And their run, like these these teams all have guys who can score well above their role requires here and there, and and connect kind of goes to that, right? Like that, that's an awesome point. I hadn't thought of it that way. Where like maybe he doesn't, you know, settle in like for the Pistons, right? Maybe he doesn't settle in as your number two scorer behind Cade. Yeah. But if he's your number three or number four, but has the ability to be the number two guy when someone has an off night, he he might have the ability to do that. That's a that's a really good because he's played that role his whole career. You know what yeah. I mean? Like every stop of the way, you know, through call, he's been the guy. The interesting thing for him is how how comfortable is he playing the other role? You know, as like the role player where he's not you know getting to just cook all the time. Um, that that's a part of it as well. But that's a great point with him, Prez, that he could kind of have that takeover potential um, when you needed it. Yeah, and and it's like you look at his his play types on synergy, and, and it's just good numbers down the line, right? Yeah, like post ups, isos, cuts, handoffs, PNR, spot. He's above average, if not very good or excellent at like all these things, which is why I'm not really worried about him. I worry much more about guys who got to scale up than got to scale down, right? Like sure. that's yeah, the, yeah. Ale- the Alex R problem, which is, you know, a whole nother podcast. But, um, and then the other thing is like, I meant to ask this at the top, but I kind of forgot. Um, And after this, we could transition to talking a little bit about the Knicks, but like, I don't know if you have expectations that the Pistons are going to go get a guy with their cap space, right. Or by trade, right. Like, who knows what the fuck is going to happen this offseason? I feel like it's going to be crazy, right? Like, yeah, if, hopefully. The, if the Timberwolves embarrass themselves on this exit, Cat might be out. Donovan Mitchell's about to remake the Cavs, right? Brandon Ingram's Brandon probably Ingram. on the way yep. out, right? Like, Draymond Green might fucking be on the way out, right? Like, who? If I'm if I'm the Pistons, I'm I'm looking at all these guys not just for adding some scoring bump, but also to just get some vets up in there, right? And then. All of a sudden, all it takes is one of those guys, and now like a connect is doesn't have to worry about having 40 usage, right? He's the fifth guy or the fourth guy or something like that. And then that's that's the scenario you want him in as a rookie where he can cook and they don't depend on it. Yeah, no, I I think this Pistons team for a 14 win team is I I would be a little more aggressive than what a normal 14 win team would be. Now, I don't mean like you're trying to get to the play in, but right. they need substantial improvement. They need a substantial growth in talent on this team. The other thing is because people may be like, oh, well, that that's silly to go get a Brandon Ingram and we could talk the fit or you know, whoever. But at a certain point, you can't develop all of these young guys. Like I, yeah. I just look through the roster yep. and the guys they have invested in, there's not going to be enough minutes if you just add another guy go sign some random dudes in free agents and they're not all going to get to play. So I would not be shocked if Langdon comes in and says, Hey, I wasn't that high on Jay Nivey. Wasn't that high. Maybe he's not high on whoever the number five pick is. And he packages those two things for 
a Brandon Ingram, something like that. I'm not saying that's specifically what it would be. I have no idea what Langton will think, but I would not be surprised if we see a little bit of consolidating and just kind of resetting the roster, but improving it because they do have $60 million in cap space. They do have some young, interesting talent, including this draft pick, where I think that they could make a step to go from 14 wins to 28 wins. And then, you know, maybe B.I. isn't the guy that that is the long-term number two guy off of Cade Cunningham, right. but maybe he's the guy that you acquire that then you move three years from now to get the guy that does. You know what I mean? But they have to improve the talent around this roster and around this team. That They got to start taking some sort of steps forward. If they're not, they might as well, Langdon might as well clean house completely and restart the rebuild. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I, I, I think what you articulated is probably what he'll do. I don't think he's going to go scorch the earth and just reboot the tank. I think he's going to, because the thing is like they can improve and still be right in the mix for any of these guys at the top of next year's draft. Cause hundred percent, that's just where the NBA is, right? A lot of teams are competing and not a lot of teams are tanking. Yep. And I don't really see that changing next year. So like you could get Ingram and just be a team that is probably still in the mix for a top five pick, but you're just not getting like dog walked every day. Yeah, Like <laughs> go, go win a bunch of games before the trade deadline. And then if you're like, okay, right. we, made, we made real improvement here. This was really good. We, we have the steps, but if we lose enough games post deadline, we can still, you know, have top five odds or something. You know, we just saw the Hawks jump from 10 into the top four or five, you know, like this stuff happens. And next year's draft has, I mean, I've just tentatively started looking at guys. I have five guys already that I'm like, man, I'm really interested in these. <laughs> yeah. so, like, uh, I think Trey Orr just had a crazy game. I saw on, on yeah, Twitter. 40 before, piece. Yeah, before we started recording. He's like, it's not, listen, this is not, I know you know this, this is not a Cooper flag or nobody type of draft coming up. Not right now anyway. So you have Ace Bailey. I like common Malawak. Like there, there's some dudes where it, it doesn't have to be the number one pick. Like you get into the top five and, and you can get interesting. Now we're 12 months away. This could all change. Yeah. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. Um, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how uh, Langdon plays it out. I personally would appreciate if he would simply trade Isaiah Stewart to the Knicks so we can bring my boy home and unite him with the coach he's destined to play for, Tibbs. For who? Who are you sending back? Who are we getting back? I haven't, I haven't thought about all that yet, man. I just need beef stew in the garden at some point in his career. That's all. Isaiah Stewart would be awesome in New York. That's a beautiful I, fit. We don't, like, obviously with the double bigs thing, like, we can't really do that. But if they decided, like, Mitch is on the way out in another deal, then and then they were therefore looking for iHeart's backup because they didn't want to wholly rely on Precious or something like that. I would fucking love Beef Stew. I've been saying he's going to shoot since he was drafted. And he's a guy who can, like, for his bench units, play the four on the five. He could be a back of five, which is, like, all he would need to do. We know he's going to go be like a slightly, slightly over the top insane person on the court, which is exactly the sweet spot for the Knicks players. So um, that's my uh, my I've wish casting. A, <laughs> I've said for a while that when Isaiah Stewart becomes a third big on a team and whenever I say third big, it's it's kind of like what you're saying in terms of being able to play some four and five. Um, most of his minutes should be at the five, but he can play. He shoots it well enough at this point, I think that he can play certain minutes against certain matchups at the four that when he gets into that role fan who, where, whether that's Detroit or somewhere else, people are going to love him because that's ultimately what he needs to be. He's not a starting four. He's not even a starting five. He is a backup big that can play that I would consider a five, four. His primary minutes should be at the five, but can also play some four. So let's, can I trade you Isaiah Stewart plus what else do I need to add to get Julius Randall to Detroit? Uh, you can't have Julius, bro. <laughs> There's a lot of Knicks fans who probably would give you Julius Randle, though, yeah. if it makes you feel better. Um, All okay, right. cool. We've gone about 45 minutes talking about the Pistons, which are real interesting just because they got a – it's a very – it's a very important offseason for them in, like, a yeah. zillion ways, perhaps more than any other team in the NBA that's not contending for a championship. Sure. Um, the Knicks have two picks and also the 38th pick. They, to your point earlier about rosters being crowded, have nowhere near enough minutes for three picks, maybe not even enough for two or one, depending on what, what shakes out. So, like, I fully expect them to trade some of them. Um, yeah. I hope 
for my own sanity that they keep one just because I've been doing this shit and they've traded out the last couple of years and it's not fun. I shouldn't say it's not fun. It's still fun, but I just want a young guy to root for. I've been, I got into draft stuff because the Knicks were so shitty for so long that it's become too a too large part of my identity. And then they just took it away from me after giving me beautiful children like Emmanuel Quickly and Deuce McBride and Mitchell Robinson. So uh, I need them to get back into it. And as you mentioned in the top of the podcast, they're in a very specific place, both in terms of the roster being crowded and also them being like deep in a weird way, right? Like they have two centers as it stands. So even though there's good centers in this draft, do you do you want to draft one in preparation for eventually moving one of those? If iHeart gets paid, right? Maybe it's Mitch. They don't have wings who are tall, right? Except for Bogdanovich, and he might end up getting non-guaranteed on the bench, right? And then, like, even though Julius is like sort of a wing, he's more of a giant forward, right? So, like, yeah, Julius would be an example of what I would call. I would call Julius a forward. Same. So, same. like that. That's kind of like again. That's a distinguishing factor. I think Julius is is of like prototypical. Like if you if people wanted to group it all together, I'm cool with it. But for me, I would call Julius a forward. <laughs> like I would even call like Bogdanovich a wing compared to Julius, just because of the yeah. physicality that Julius has. Yeah, totally, totally. Especially the way he played last year. If this was like Julius's random like Dirk Nowitzki season a couple <laughs> years ago, then I'd be like, yeah, sure, wing Julius. But he's uh, morphed away from that lately. We'll see where he comes back after the shoulder surgery. Sure. And then on the guard front, like we have Jalen, but we actually don't have a lot of ball handlers, right? Like even yeah. Deuce, who was incredible in the playoffs and Absolutely. was scoring, he's not really like diming people up off the pick and roll. So we don't really have a backup point guard right now. Um, right. So like when, when you and Vicini on y'all spot, were talking about Colec, like, I, yeah. I think I, I see the, the vision for that because like, you know, you could get like a random journeyman, whoever. Right. But yep. why not fill that slot with somebody with upside? Right. Like I could see the argument for it. So I could see the argument. This is all a long way of saying I could see the argument for wings for ball handlers and for bigs for the Knicks. So, um, to you, do any of those needs in particular stand out? Obviously, we don't know like the Knicks offseason strategy, but like what do you think about what they should do strategically? Yeah, no, I mean, as I look through their roster as well, like it's it's a really nice roster in terms of the starting lineup, and then even with the bench, right? Like, you know, they're gonna have to I don't know who's coming off the bench next year. Hart Hart comes off the bench next year if this team's fully healthy. Is it a is it yeah. a Brunson, DiVincenzo, OG, Randall? what Hartenstein starting yeah, lineup pro- probably unless they uh overpay the nets for Mikhail Bridges yeah so then you're looking at what Deuce Hart Bogdanovich and Mitchell like that's a crazy nine man rotation mm-hmm. already so to your point though when you start looking into it Deuce is actually looks like he's is going to thrive as like an off the ball player right? right knocking down right. shots and being a pest so you can look at an on-ball player. Bagnanovich, even if they bring him back, is it's a one year. He's getting like it, it's gonna right. be one year, and I'm assume that's eventually essentially gonna be salary matching for a yep. trade that is made. Yep. Um, and then again to bring it back to my pistons, like lots of people think they should go pay Isaiah Hartenstein to get him away from New York. Like that they could really use somebody like him. I think Hartenstein has a chance to to make some real money. So again, like you said, I think you could look at all of these spots. So Let's start at ball handlers. In this range, the two guys I have are Bub Carrington out of Pittsburgh Ooh. and and Tyler Kolick. So Bub is a guy that he's from Pittsburgh. He kind of got some swag and some attitude and some ke- competitiveness to him that I love. Later in the season, like I think initially people would be like, not a Tibbs guy, but later in the season, we saw him really lock in defensively and really, really guard. He is like a... Good passer. His superpower offensively is the pull-up jump shot. Like, I think he shoots it really well from two and from three. But just in general, the pull-up jumper, maybe this is a kid that he is younger. To your point earlier, he's slight of frame right now. But maybe this is a kid that eventually takes on some of, like, the second unit. Right, down the line. Yeah. And, And he's a little bit taller, so you could probably play him and Deuce together. 
Um, I have him here six foot five. I'd have to pull the combine numbers. His pick and roll stats on synergy are crazy too. And a yeah. lot of that is because of that pull up scoring. And uh, for people who what don't the, know, Bob is are, like 19 at draft night, maybe even younger. He's like one of the youngest players in the class. Yeah. What, what are, what's the pull up? What's the overall pull up sh- jump shot percentage? Oh man. It's something crazy. Cause well, I know his three point pull up was like not, Super crazy, but his twos were like the twos, yeah, fifty percent or something on pull. Yeah, that dudes. might be right. I think that that sounds more right. I may have given him a little bit too much with his pull up threes. Um, and and to your point, while you're, it sounded like you had synergy pulled up. That's why I asked. But yeah, yeah, uh, he's he's eighteen right now. That he won't turn nineteen till after summer league. Right, and he's uh, uh he's definitely got a little bit of sauce and what people don't realize about Tibbs is like people are like oh Tibbs loves his dogs who get after it on defense and that's true but there's another characteristic that Tibbs arguably loves even more which is guys who are assertive on offense that's why Deuce finally started playing because we knew dude Tibbs Deuce has been good at defense right like that didn't get him playing time what got him playing time was him being like all right if I'm open I'm gonna shoot it I may even venture into the paint once a week, right? Like this is this is what finally got Deuce into the Tibbs inner circle. So Bub Bub is not shy about uh no. getting his own bucket. So in the, I mean, from that had- sense, he might he might be a low key uh he might have a fan in Tibbs eventually. And so Bub was he was just under six four without shoes. So he's six five with shoes and a six eight wingspan. So, um, big guard. yeah, d- decent sized guard again. So I think you could theoretically play him and deuce together, especially where deuce is kind of that more physical player. Um, he was almost 80% from the free throw line as a freshman, good assist to turnover ratio, all of that stuff played a ton of minutes. Uh, Bub Carrington is really, really interesting again. Like I think it would, I think, I don't know that he's going to be there is the other thing the more i listen to sam i don't know that he (laughs) makes it to 24 he's higher than 24 on my personal board yeah it feels like he's uh getting a little bit of a bump as people realize oh he's six five and 18 and already is good at the hard things and we just have to teach him the other things so i i he's got some fans in uh in the Knicks draft world um who will be pleased to hear you bring him up um and i know we We've talked about Kolek on Twitter and yeah. you guys have covered him and he's like a pick and roll maestro, which like yeah. if you just need somebody to run the second unit and that's not even necessarily mean to like score a ton in the second unit because you will, to your point, you will have Hart, um, Deuce and maybe even staggered Randall, right? Like there will be guys who can score probably playing with you in the bench. You just need somebody who can like initiate things with a pick and roll and just get the get the ball moving. Cause that's not really deuces jam and it's not really Julius's jam. So um, from that perspective, I could see Kolek, but I'm interested in what you think um, about available wings and sure. bigs in that yeah. range. Yeah. So wings, my top wing would be a, a guy like Jalen Tyson, who's a little bit older, three schools in three years. There's a storyline behind that physical guy. I think he can shoot it. His, his role and archetype is going to change in the league because he was so on ball uh, this last year in college. I actually have Jacoby Walter a a little bit lower than most. So that would be another one freshman from Baylor that can really shoot it. I believe in the shot. I don't know how much I believe in all of the other stuff. And then you get in. So like here's, I think you have categories here. You have the young guys, Keyshawn, Keyshawn George out of Miami, Johnny Furphy out of Kansas, Justin Edwards out of Kentucky. And then you have some of the older guys, Baylor Shireman out of Creighton, uh, Alex Caravan out of Connecticut. Peyton Sanford is a guy I really like out of Iowa. Those are kind of, they're a little bit older and real just like floor spacers, maybe not as much upside with those guys. And then there's all, I can't imagine Knicks fans aren't talking about Ryan Dunn, right? Like, cause just the defense is silly um, I would consider Don more of a, a forward than a wing because there's just not a whole lot of offensive skill set. But those are a lot of the names. Are, are there any of those that you're higher on or, or Knicks fans tend to, to lean towards? Yeah, it depends who you ask. Some people like Dunn um, because he's got he is like the S tier defensive dog version that, you know, we, we we got a taste of that with OG and it's now just like, give us another one. Right. But like yeah. I, I'm a lower on him just because I'm like, I don't think 
to my point about a pub, I don't think Tibbs is gonna the first time Ryan Dunn passes up a three, Tibbs is gonna like punt him into the Hudson River or some shit. Yeah. So like I, I don't maybe they could like refine that in Westchester or on the bench and in practice. Um I love Jalen Tyson. Um I think kind of it's similar to what we were talking about with Connect, where it's like he's not gonna have to do everything. And maybe he does play a little bit more defense since he yep, doesn't have agreed. to do everything. We know he can do off ball stuff, right? He can, he, he's a solid, he's not connect level off, off the catch, but he's solid. He can cut. He got a little bounce. Um, and if he catches it versus a rotated defense, he might break some ankles out here. Right. Yeah. Which is like the way, the quickest way into my heart personally. So uh, I, I'm a huge fan of him. Um, there's some other guys who, I think are probably more likely to be in the second rounder in the second round who I have first round grades on. Okay. Like, like Neat Clifford and, and Melvin, a yink, a Jinka, just yeah. like they're big. They could do stuff. Like, yeah, that's what I want. I want guys who are big, who could do stuff. We got guys who are small and could do stuff off the bench. I want the other guys. Yeah. Uh, Clifford is one that I've stayed a little lower on than some. I know like no ceilings loves Neat Clifford. They've been, you know, <laughs> pushing mm -hmm. him all year. Ajinka is, is interesting as well. I mean, you talk about not turning down threes, that kid will not do that. Like he would. <laughs> and here's the thing you talk about the physicality. Jalen Tyson is, is that body type that you're talking about. But Melvin is that also like, I remember the first time I turned on the film, I was like, this kid looks good. Like he's strong, strong kid. And I, I keep referring to him as a kid. He he's 19. He'll turn right. 20 here in a month or so. But no, those are interesting names. I, I have them in my strong second round pick tier, yep. but they're right at the top of it. Perez. Right. So like, it's not like this isn't crazy talk to me at all. You know, Keisha Johnson is another one that I would put in that mix. Then he actually leads my second round pick tier. He's a, a wing forward out of Arizona. He played at San Diego state the year before He's physical, a big boy. <laughs> crazy, crazy, crazy bouncy. And I think he'll shoot well enough. So if you're looking for that, you know, the, the picks in the twenties, maybe a little bit too early, but like you said, the Knicks also have 38. I think all of those guys you mentioned, you know, for me anyway, would be awesome picks there at 38. Yeah, it, it's interesting because like we we have that first and second round line on our respective boards. But like, I don't know how yours is, but for me, it's just kind of a blob from like <laughs> 20 to 40. So like, yes, the round is going to change, but like any of those guys could end up being oh. the best player in that group <laughs> so quick peek behind the curtain for mine i have seven in my first tier and again i'm this doesn't this changes from year to year i'm not saying they're tier one yeah, players yeah, yeah. i'm just saying just this my, year yeah my first tier of guys is seven my second tier of guys goes from eight to 18 but then the tier you're talking about <laughs> 19 to 38 like just like yeah, you, exactly. 19 to 38 is my i put it as in the first round top of the second round um and then my second round group goes from 39 to 56 you know so um th there's a lot of guys and it comes down to fit you know so when you talk about bigs i mean zach Eady is a very common name i feel like mm -hmm. they get mocked to the knicks here so zach Eady, eves misi who's a completely opposite end of the spectrum whenever it comes to types of bigs and then khalil Ware is the other one that i would have in this range and he's a different type of big himself so all three of those guys are interesting to me here where the knicks are picking but would be a completely different type of big for them and i, and I should also mention Oso igadaro because i do like Oso. yeah i i like all the bigs and it's like whatever flavor you like you can probably find that if you're the knicks um, yeah ed might end up going higher just because he's Zach Eady, right? Like, I got to say, like, I, I started out firmly, like, anti ED. Same. I, I had a, a good convo with Twitter with, with Sam and you about it. And I've become ED curious. I'm not yeah. going to lie. And Listen, just... <laughs> we're, we're, Prez, we're the same. I had him in the second <laughs> round, and he sets at 23 on my board right now. And I'll be honest, I was a part of a, a consensus mock recently where he went number nine to the Grizzlies because – Klingon was already off the board and ED kind of makes sense like, for what I they don't need hate it. I don't hate it. I, I don't like, I don't love it, but I don't hate it. I understand it. I get it. Um, 
Uh, I think the Knicks here, if if that's a, so real quick, Edie's this big monster big. I, I assume most people, Misi is your twitchy, bouncy, young. Maybe He's like he resetting develop. Mitchell Robinson. That's the yeah. way I describe it to people. <laughs> yeah. And he, but to your point earlier, he's skinny right now. Right. Khalil Ware has like motor concerns and some of that stuff, but he's this like, maybe he can shoot it, has a little more skill type of big that also can catch lobs and protect the rim. So you're getting, and then Oso can't shoot at all, but can really pass short roll, has a really great floater and and is more bouncy than people give him credit for. So again, all and listen, I should I think Deron Holmes the second out of Dayton is is really good. I have him in a tier above all of these guys, mm -hmm. but most people would have him lower. Deron Holmes is probably another name we should mention here as well. Is he? I think Deron is super skilled. Um, just dominated the A10 this last season. So that would be another name for for your Knicks fans to know, I guess. Yeah, in my uh, I did a little. Nick's wish list and like I I didn't even bother sorting the bigs. I was just like like in the top, it's like Devin Carter, Tyler Smith, that is like Nick Clifford and all these wigs, that and then it's just like all the bigs in their own like category together, depending on what the Knicks want. So um that'll be particularly interesting because if they if they pick a big, that means I would have to guess that like Mitch's days are numbered. Not to say he's gonna get traded this year, but like eventually they would look to move him and you know with his injuries and stuff unfortunate as it is I, I would totally get that so it'll be interesting to see i would be happy with any of those bigs that you mentioned um even like where is probably the one i'm the lowest on but he's yep, also same. just i what this is gonna sound silly but like i wonder how much of that is just because he's kind of boring right like yeah. holmes is cool it does all this funky stuff and Edie's like nine thousand feet tall and igadoro does floaters like i heart and where it's just like your generic create a 2k big from like any 2k game yeah. of the last like 15 years and <laughs> that's I'm like, awesome what? but he's and he's also coached by nick great mike woodson so uh we know he's learned some things down there had a better uh, season than he did as a freshman absolutely uh i'm i was remit like i should have brought up tyler smith much earlier in this conversation that's another one that i feel like uh the because of the range and the mm. skill set offensively makes a lot of sense I'm worried, like, my biggest concern with Tyler Smith is the defense. And so, like, am I yeah. thinking too much into this that he never sees the floor with Tibbs because of the defense? Or will Tibbs love him enough because Smith will be more than willing to let it fly from three? Nah, I don't I don't, I don't think it would be a good fit with okay. the Knicks. Not, not, not even just because of the defense, but, like, because, like, he, he has defensive tools, but he just has to learn – defense like the same way like somebody in school has to learn biology like yeah it's just gonna take time and usually the guys the knicks have picked they're not that far behind in terms of learning those intricacies sure now that could change maybe they decide this guy has so much talent we'll work and, and we're deep so we can finally take a swing like that which is what i would like them to do personally but sure um, you know what they've been doing has clearly worked out spectacularly. So who am I to fucking doubt that? So um, despite all that, he you know he he was remaining at the top of my Knicks wish list just because I'm like this guys who are this tall who can shoot like that yep. who maybe can do other stuff like don't don't come around too often. So maybe consider that. So yeah, um, for sure, we'll see. Uh, it'll be really interesting. Um, this was like a super good speed primer on what the Knicks I, I don't even need draft content for the rest of the year I can just run back these 10 minutes for anybody who's interested um Bryce thanks for joining this was a lot of fun um people please follow Bryce at Motor City Hoops check out the various podcasts and YouTube channel for game theory with him and Sam Vicini there's a lot of good stuff on there including shooting mechanics breakdowns apparently that I missed out on um and uh Bryce if there's anything else that you got on the way that you want to let folks know about feel free to just plug that now so uh people can be on the lookout for that yeah so i'd say the only thing maybe they'd be interested in because i doubt you guys want to come listen to a piston specific podcast is the Substack. so on my motor city hoop Substack, there's like draft scouts that are a little piston specific but just in general you're still going to get the gist of the players or I've dropped over 30 on the basketball bulletin Substack, And that's a project I do with Keith Smith and Trevor Lane of the front office show. 
So check that out over on the basketball bulletin. Again, I've dropped over 30. Um, we're working on the fourth mock draft that we've done over there as well, where we've allowed trade. So that's a lot of fun. It's taking forever because of that, but it's a lot of fun. So lots of content over on Substack as well. But essentially, if you if you want, give me a follow on Twitter at Motor City Hoops, and you'll be able to find any content I'm pushing out there. All right, y'all heard the man do what he says. Listeners, thanks. And uh, we... We'll see you next time. And as we approach the end of the playoffs, we have a fucking avalanche of draft things coming out on the Strickland, including some things we've never done before. So stay tuned for that. I'm not going to ruin the surprise. Y'all just going to have to check it out. We'll catch you next time. Thank you.